2,500 years ago, the angel Gabriel delivered an astonishing message to the prophet Daniel concerning the 70 years captivity of Judah. Daniel was given a cryptic code concerning 70 Shevaim, which would be fulfilled in three separate but interwoven layers throughout the history of the nation of Israel. That divine prophecy has been sealed up until the generation when increased revelation and scientific knowledge would allow mankind to understand its complex mathematical codes. Understanding this prophecy has been the lifelong quest of biblical historian Michael Rood. After 30 years of searching the chronological details of Yahshua's ministry, the three prophetic layers of Daniel's prophecy for the first time in history seem to be coming into clear focus. If Michael's calculations are correct, the nation of Israel is already in the third prophetic layer of Daniel's prophecy, and the countdown to the thermonuclear ruin of Damascus prophesied by the prophet Isaiah has already begun. The solution to the Jonah Code, which was over 30 years in coming, has proven to be the foundational equation of this historic discovery. Join Michael Rood for nearly 10 hours of programming that will change your life and your perspective of the future. Michael will have you on the edge of your seat as he teaches the greatest story never told, The Jonah Code. This is the very time that it's done. That night, that is when the Last Supper takes place. After sundown, Judas has already gone out, and he goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane where Yeshua is arrested. He is then taken to the house of Annas, the father-in-law of the high priest, and Annas says, take him immediately to Caiaphas and get the rest of the Sanhedrin together. This is a kangaroo court of the Sanhedrin, they're meeting in the middle of the night. It is forbidden. No one can make judgment. The Sanhedrin can't make judgment in the middle of the night. But they are going to get together the people that will convict Yeshua. That's their goal. Yosef of Arimathea, Nicodemus are not going to be invited to the party that night, I guarantee you. And then at the house of Caiaphas, that's when Peter denies the Lord three times. And after he is then tried in that mock trial. They led Yeshua from Caiaphas under the hall of judgment. This is Pilate's judgment hall, it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. The Pharisees refused to go into Pilate's judgment hall. They do not want to be defiled so that they can do what? Eat the Passover. Has the Passover meal happened yet? No, absolutely not. I was just reminded of something that, well, I guess if this goes on television, I shouldn't talk about the theological cemetery in Dallas uh, that, uh, where this was hatched, but they try to say that the Galileans kept Passover a day before the Jews from uh, Jerusalem did. They had two separate Passover meals. Only in your sick, twisted, western Gentile mind, it's never happened in the whole course of human history, but no, we gotta make up stuff. Just make up stuff thinking that people are so stupid they cannot read the Bible and they can't read history for themselves. Oh, another one. Another great one, that the high priest, they tied a rope around the leg of the high priest in case he died in the Holy of Holies, they could drag him out. Who made that one up? But yet it has a life of its own, never in the history of the world. I mean, you could never read this anywhere. It was just made up in America, and they keep on going by. I mean, what prophetic shadow picture is that? I'm not sure. I guess... Yeshua being dragged out of the throne room? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's like, <laughs> I mean, the goofiest stuff gets made up. No, 
There's one Passover, there's one day the Passover lambs are sacrificed. The day of preparation, it's a work day, it's a 14th, that's all there is to it, and the lambs are eaten after sundown on the 15th. There's nothing else that works. Anything else is a fabrication, it's a fairy tale. Now, they didn't go into the judgment hall because they didn't want to be defiled so they could eat the Passover. So Pilate had to go all the way out. Yeshua's in the judgment hall. Pilate sees he's got somebody that's brought in for judgment early in the morning. They get him into this thing and then he has to go all the way out and say, what accusations do you bring against this man? They answered and said, if he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him unto thee. And Pilate answered, then take him away and judge him according to your own law. Malefactor means bad guy. And Pilate says, oh, uh, if he weren't a malefactor, if he weren't a bad guy, we wouldn't have brought him to you. Okay, then judge him according to your law because there's no such law against being a bad guy. You have to actually do something that's against the law. So if you've got some kind of law against bad guys, then go ahead and judge them yourself. Don't bother me with this stuff. And then they came back and said, well, he's stirring up all sorts of insurrection. He makes himself a king. Oh, he makes himself a king. Well, this can sound a little bit like treason. And so Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called for Yeshua, and he said, are you the king of the Jews? This is what they're saying. Are you the king of the Jews? And Yeshua answered and said, sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it of me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? See, Yeshua is calling him on the ninth commandment. Thou shalt not bear false witness. If someone has borne a witness against him, then the scriptures say that you bring the person that is born the witness and the one that is being witnessed against, they are both brought before the judges who make diligent inquiry to find out if this person has brought a legitimate charge. If the man has brought a false witness, if he does not have firsthand information himself, it is perjury. And... If he is borne witness against this person, and if it would have cost this man his hand, his eye, or his life, then the same verdict will come upon that man. Cut off his hand, put out his eye, you kill him so that evil is put out of the land. Yeshua said, are you bearing this witness against me of yourself, or did someone else tell you? He said, am I beholden to the Torah? Am I a Jew? Am I supposed to go by your law of a witness? Your own nation and your priest have delivered you to me. What have you done? You know, bear witness against yourself. Now, can, can you please give me a little help here, Yeshua? I, I, you know, give me a bone. You know, I, they want me to convict you, but they've given me nothing. Can you tell me something that you've done wrong that I couldn't convict you of? See, you know, self-incrimination is not legal either. And, uh, oh, and this is the place, this is the place that I am just amazed. Because who, who is that, uh, that, that uh, drunken anti-Semite in Hollywood? Oh, Mel Gibson. Wait, I shouldn't say that. Okay, Mel Gibson, that brilliant Bible scholar, <laughs> actually spent millions of dollars making a movie based on a dream of a clueless nun. Missed so much of this thing because this is the point where Pilate goes back out and says, this man has done nothing wrong. I find no fault in him. Four times he is going to tell the Pharisees, I find no fault in him. This time when he goes out, I find no fault in him. He's done nothing wrong. He said, what do you mean? He is stirring up insurrection all over the Galilee. He said, the Galilee? He's from the Galilee? 
He said, yes, he's from the Galilee. Well, why didn't you say so? That's Herod's jurisdiction. Guards, get this man and march him up to Herod's palace. And so they then march Yeshua up to Herod's palace. The Pharisees trundle along behind. And when they get to Herod's palace, of course, it is announced that Pilate has sent Yeshua there for him because it's his jurisdiction. And when Herod hears this, Herod is so excited. He has wanted to see Yeshua for a long time. He has been talking about this for months. And finally, he's here. He thinks that maybe he's going to see him do a miracle, pull a rabbit out of the hat or something. And so Herod is really upbeat about this whole thing. Yeshua is brought in, and so Herod comes out and says, I have heard so much about you, please. And as he begins to talk to him, Yeshua is absolutely stone-faced and doesn't open his mouth. He refused to say a single word to him. And Herod gets really upset at this point. You're not talking to me? And he begins to jeer and to mock him. And so he goes out and he finds out the, from the Pharisees, those who are accusing him, what these accusations are. Oh, he makes himself a king, the king of the Jews. Oh, we'll see about that. So he calls his guard and say, bring out the royal robe. They put the royal robe on him and they begin to mock him. They don't beat him, they just mock him. Oh, the big man, king of the Jews. Oh, yeah, you're, you're, you're really special. You're really going to take over the planet now, huh? and just kept on jeering and mocking him, trying to prod him, trying to get him to say something. He refused to utter a single word, and Herod was just absolutely furious. Took the robe off him, marched him back down to Pilate. This time, Herod goes down with him. And it says that when Herod gets down there with Pilate, the two of them could never get along on anything. All the years, they never got along, but this day, because they had a mutual problem, they became close friends. They sat down and discussed this thing. And Pilate then finally said, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have him beaten, I'm going to scourge him, and then I'm going to release him. And so, sound like a reasonable thing to do. you got to satisfy these people because there's no way we're going to get out of this thing. Shua is not answering anything to Herod. Nothing is moving, and so we're going to beat him. We're going to beat a confession out of him. And so they strip Yeshua's garments off him, and then a Roman soldier takes a scourge, which has leather thongs on him with pieces of bone and metal tied to the ends, and the first time that he puts it into Yeshua's back and strikes that scourge into him and then rips it away, and chunks of flesh and blood go flying everywhere, and not a word comes out of Yeshua's mouth. Whoa, they are marveling at this. They have never seen anyone hold their tongue like that. Oh, this big Roman soldier now, oh, we got a big boy on our hands, huh? He takes that scourge and one more time, rakes it across his back and rips more chunks of flesh out of his body. And he doesn't say anything. He doesn't cry out a bit. They've never seen anything like this. And so now the manhood of this Roman soldier is being challenged. He can kill a bull with one punch, but he can't get this guy to scream, oh, we're going to see about that. Before it's over, it says the Yeshua is more gnarled and mangled than any man had ever been. Chunks of his beard were just ripped out of his face. He was marred more than any man, yet he didn't open his mouth. And Pilate, and Herod watched this and never had seen anything like this in their life. Finally, they brought him out, said, Behold, the man. He said, Take him away, crucify him. He said, Crucify him, this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, We have a law. And our, by our law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard that, he was even more afraid. When he heard that, he makes himself the son of God. They just saw him go through a beating that no man had ever gone through. He makes himself the son of God. And Pilate went back in the judgment hall. And he said, who are you? Who are you? 
Yeshua didn't answer a word. You don't talk to me. You don't answer me. Don't you realize I have the power to release you? I have the power to snuff out your life. Yeshua said, you have absolutely no power over me except that it's given to you from above. And right then, Pilate's blood ran cold. From that moment on, he sought to release him. There is no way that he wants anything to do with this. He is afraid. His wife has come out and said, have nothing to do with this innocent man. Nothing to do with him. He's innocent. Pilate washes his hands. I am innocent of this man's blood. And he sat down in his judgment seat. There's a preparation of the Passover. The preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said, behold your king. And the chief priest said, we have no king but Caesar. And then he let him out. Because Pilate was finally put over a barrel. It was either his allegiance to Caesar, or he was going to let this man go free. And with the pressure put on him, he said, take him away and crucify him. At the very hours of Passover lambs were being sacrificed in the Temple Mount, Yeshua was hanging there on the Roman cross. The rest of the details I can't go into tonight. That's why you must get the great secret of Solomon's Temple. There is nothing that I will ever teach that's more important than what is in that. And if you have to sell your house, get that video. It's only $150,000 on sale (laughs) right now. And a bargain at twice that price. When Shua knew his hours come, he said, I thirst. He cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. He has bowed his head. And he gave up the ghost. And it says the Jews, therefore, because of the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day. It wasn't a weekly Sabbath. This is a high day. It is the feast of unleavened bread coming up. Did not I tell you that this was the situation? Here it is right in the scripture. It is a high Sabbath, not a weekly Sabbath. They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away, because it sometimes took up to a week for a man to be tortured to death on the cross. So a Roman soldier came out, came up to the first one hanging on the cross, took a big 65-pound steel bar and swung it and smashed his lower legs, and when his lower legs were broken, that man had no bones to push back up on to get another breath. And no matter how he struggled, he could not get another breath. And his eyes glassed over, and he was dead. Roman soldier walked up to the next one, took the steel bar, and one last blood-curdling scream. It was his last breath. It says that when he came up to Yeshua, saw that he was dead already, marveled. But he didn't break his legs. The soldiers took a spear, pierced his side, and out came blood and water. The Passover lamb was not to have a broken bone for a reason, because it was a picture of the Messiah. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees came together into Pilate saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said while he was still alive that after three days I will rise again. They knew what he said. It's only the Western Christian church that doesn't know what he said. Command, therefore, that sepulcher be made sure until the end of the third day. And just as the scriptures say that Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. And so here is when it took place. This is when Yeshua was cut off, but not for himself. It was on Wednesday, the 14th. In order for Passover to happen on a Wednesday, then we have to have the first sliver of the new moon of the Aviv barley appear after sundown on a Wednesday night. There are no options. Any other day, the crucifixion can't take place on the correct day, and you will never get three days and three nights. 
You will never have Yeshua fulfilling the bickering, the first fruit offering. You'll never have him raising the dead and presenting them as the first fruits after three days and three nights. The scriptures will be destroyed if the crucifixion takes place on any year in which the new moon of the Aviv barley does not take place on a Wednesday after sundown. That is how precise these calculations have to be for the scriptures to be fulfilled. Any other day is a fatal error. Every other day is a fatal error, and you cannot get out of it. So I don't care what your pet philosophy or theory is, if it is not the new moon appearing at Wednesday at sundown when the barley is a vive and Passover happening on a Wednesday, there are fatal errors in it and you can just throw your whole theory in the trash can. Because this way, the scriptures work from beginning to end. From Genesis to Revelation. Now, we are going to see how all this fits in with prophecy for the last days. That Daniel's prophecy, the 70 Shabuahim prophecy, is fulfilled on three layers. And we're going to see each one of those three layers. One of them, which has been mostly fulfilled, and yet there's a section yet to be fulfilled in the future, Another layer which is completely fulfilled and a layer in which we are right now in the midst of. And that is where we are going. And once we understand when Yeshua's ministry began and when his crucifixion happened, then we can see the rest of the details and how all these prophecies will then be fulfilled finally in our day and in our time. So what we have seen is that Yeshua's ministry, day one of week one, began on the 19th day of the 11th month of 4026 from creation, which was 27 of the common era, of February 16th. That was day one, week one. That is the day that Yeshua was mikveh in the Jordan. That is the day that the Holy Spirit came down upon him in the form of a dove, remained on him. That was the one sign that the high priest chosen by the Almighty, Yohanan ben Zechariah the Kohen, the son of Zechariah and Elisheva, that is the day that he mikveh him and he heard the voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It was just 41 days later that we see that Yohanan was giving his testimony to the Kohanim and the Levites that were sent by the Pharisees from Jerusalem and he gave them the entire record including the incident where he heard the voice from heaven, the bat call, the voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That is what then prompted the Pharisees to develop the theology, to develop the particular position, which is then detailed in the account of the excommunication of Rabbi Eliezer. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail concerning the excommunication of Rabbi Eliezer, only to say that Rabbi Eliezer, who was one of the most respected rabbis of all time, was in direct disagreement and contradiction with all the other rabbis concerning the ritual impurity or the possibility of contracting ritual impurity of a stone oven. And in the whole course of their debate, Rabbi Eliezer insisted that he was correct on it, and he said, if I am correct, let the trees prove it. And right then, as everyone looked outside, an entire orchard was uprooted and flew up into the sky, and all the rabbis turned to Rabbi Eliezer and said, that's an incredible miracle, but we don't listen to trees. After a series of these miracles in which Rabbi Eliezer called upon nature itself to attest to his virtue and to his being correct, finally he said, if I am correct, 
let heaven prove it. And right then, a crack of thunder and the voice of God shouted down from heaven, why do you dispute with Rabbi Eliezer? You know that in all points of the Torah, he is without fault. And the rabbis all turned to Rabbi Eliezer and said, well, that is indeed a miracle, but we don't listen to a voice from heaven. Once the Almighty has given his Torah, his word to us, we have the right to interpret it any way that we feel right, and Almighty God has to obey our decision. That is the basic story, that is the foundational principle of rabbinic Judaism. This is the foundational principle that once the Torah is given to them, however they interpret it is correct, Almighty God must obey them, and they do not listen to a voice from heaven. I believe that that response by the Pharisees came as the direct testimony from John who said, I heard a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the Pharisees said, we don't listen to a voice from heaven. We have our own religious system. Almighty God must obey us now. Well, we see in Yeshua's ministry that he didn't do a whole lot of obeying anything that the Pharisees had instituted. And not that I am at war with the Pharisees, I am just simply at war with the entire world religious system. I'm not picking on anyone in particular, I'm picking on everybody. But I believe that this is the part of the gospel of the kingdom that is just never told. That Yeshua's words are never taught, and what he did and what he taught is really unknown in the Western world. And that we have to understand the gospels and what he was teaching. This is a day that the voice from heaven shouted down, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then the day after John gave his record to the Kohanim and the Levites sent by the Pharisees, that very next day he saw Yeshua come out of the wilderness and he pointed at him as two of his disciples stood by his side and said, behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. That was a Aviv one that began the acceptable year of the Lord. It was the first day of the first month of the year, 47 of the common era, excuse me, 4027 from creation or 27 of the common era in which that took place. Now we are going to go back into ancient history for just a few moments. And we're going to discuss the 70 Shavuaim, or 77s of Daniel 9. Now, in order to understand this prophecy, we have to go all the way back to the Torah. We have to go back to the time that we came out of Egypt, and we were being given instructions while we were at Mount Sinai. And... The instructions that were given at a particular point is that when we go into the land that's promised to us, if we then take on the worship of the pagan gods, if we learn the way of the heathen, how they worship and serve their gods and do the same thing and say we're doing it to him, the Almighty said, this abomination that you're committing is going to cause you to be chastised by me. And if when I bring the enemy against you and chastise you, and I show you and I continually try to get you to repent and to obey my commandments and, do, and that you do not learn the way of the heathen and that you get the land of Israel cleaned up and you have it expunged from all vestiges of pagan sun god worship, he said that if you refuse to obey me on this, I am going to chastise you and when you are punished by the enemy, if you still refuse to obey me and come back to me, I'm going to multiply your captivity seven times. And he said it over and over and over and over. Why did he repeat it so many times? Because that's exactly what Israel did. The northern ten tribes, no matter how many times the Syrians came against us, because we were 
involved in pagan sun god worship. We refuse to worship the true God according to spirit and truth as we were given the commandments. Then we kept on getting whacked and finally that captivity was multiplied several times over and we were completely evicted from the land. There was also another prophecy in the very same section that said that once we entered the land, and it was contingent upon us first entering the land, but when we got into the land, then we were to count seven years. And the seventh year that we were in the land was to be a Sabbath year. And we were not to sow, we were not to reap, we were to just to let the land lay fallow, and what we had harvested from the sixth year would not only last through the seventh year, but when we planted in the eighth year, we would still be eating of the produce of the sixth year while the plants were growing up, and we would still be living in the abundance of the sixth year in the ninth year. Now, this is an incredible promise that we were given, that we were going to be able to let the land to rest, we ourselves could rest, we could spend the time in the scriptures and to have a sabbatical, to have every seventh year of our lives to spend in studying the scriptures and, and, and letting the land rest and we ourselves being able to rest somewhat for in that year. What a wonderful gift this was. And so we were told every Sabbath year, every seventh year, we are to let the land rest. And if we did not let the land rest, that the Almighty would send the enemy against us, and the enemy would carry us away into a foreign country, and while we are gone out of the land, the land will have its Sabbath rest. So he said that the land is going to have a Sabbath rest every seven years. And we are either going to do it my way or we're going to do it my way. But we are going to do it my way. The land is going to rest. Every seventh year, the land will have its Sabbath. And after seven Sabbath years, the very next year would be a Jubilee year. And that is a special rest year. Now, Jeremiah prophesied that Judah would be taken into captivity and that we would serve 70 years in captivity. Why? Because for the 490 year period of the kings, we never kept the Sabbath year. We owed exactly 70 years in which we would be in captivity and the land must rest. Now, this is the period of time in which Daniel lived. Daniel was from the household of the king. He was of the royal family. He was trained in all the wisdom of Judah, all the wisdom of the scriptures. He was taken into captivity and he was trained in all the wisdom of the Chaldeans as well. Daniel was the president of Babylon under three different kings, three different emperors. He was one of the most wealthy men in the entire empire. And near the end of his life, Daniel was reading the scroll of Yeremiah, Jeremiah, which was written in the handwriting of Baruch, his scribe. And Daniel was seeing that these 70 years that Judah was prophesied to be in captivity so that the land could rest, these 70 years were just about fulfilled at this time. And so Daniel was praying to the God of heaven. Now Daniel realizes that in his position of authority and what has happened in his life, that he can depend on heaven to give him an answer when he needs an answer. He is praying about these 70 years because he knows that he has a responsibility. There, is, there are things that will be required of Daniel in his life as a servant of the one true God, and he needs to know the times and the seasons that the Creator has put in his hands and in the hands of the nation. And so he is praying about this, and then the angel Gabriel is sent from heaven and delivers a message to him. And this is the message that Daniel gets when he is praying about the fulfillment of the 70 years. 
the angel Gabriel says, 70 Shavuaim are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. The word Shavuaim is a very peculiar usage of the Hebrew language. And anyone that speaks Hebrew today immediately assumes that it is 70 Shavuot. 70 Shavuot are determined. But it's not 70 Shavuot, 70 weeks. It is literally 70 Shavua, which is seven, and im on the end of the Hebrew word is in the plural. So they are 70 sevens. And this is very cryptic. It's very unusual usage. But this is a very unusual prophecy and is being underscored by a very unusual usage of words, which means literally sevens. And so what are these sevens? The question, I believe, will be answered in the course of this. The angel Gabriel responds to Daniel's question about the 70 years of captivity and gives 70 Shavuaim a cryptic answer as he says, Seventy-sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. To accomplish all of these things, all of these positive things, it is going to take 70 so Shavuaim, or 70 weeks, to do this. Therefore, the angel said, listen very carefully and understand. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens and 62 sevens. Seven sevens and 62 sevens are a total of 69 sevens. 69 sevens, if you just do it mathematically, is 483. Now, we know that from the commandment to go forth and restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. That's a total of 69 sevens, but for the whole prophecy to be completely fulfilled and sealed off is going to take a total of how many sevens? 70 sevens. But from the commandment unto the Messiah is seven sevens and 62 sevens. Now, what I am going to show you in this particular chart is I am going to take you to Aviv 1 of 27 of the Common Era. Aviv 1, this is the very day that Yeshua walked over the Jordan River. Yohanan, the high priest, said, Behold, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. This begins the first day of the first month. This begins the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, I am going to go back exactly seven sevens and 62 sevens, or in other words, a total of 69 sevens, or 483 years. This is what I'm going to do, and we are going to find ourselves in the year 457 before the Common Era. Now, this is um, really quite uh, an interesting thing to be able to go back to 457 before the Common Era because this is a date that is really not even disputed among all of the secular scholars and astronomers. Because how the Chaldeans kept their calendar and marked out the passage, the inauguration of kings, the death of kings, is by using the movement of the heavenly bodies, including solar and lunar eclipses. And we can go back in time and find these solar and lunar eclipses. And we find out that eight years before this time, in the fall of the year, is when Xerxes, the king, died in the fall of the year, and Artaxerxes took over the throne. Now, in Chaldean uh, literature, this is called the year of ascension. This is the time frame in which now Artaxerxes took over the throne, but in Babylon, the king was not inaugurated until the beginning of the year which in Babylonian reckoning was at the vernal equinox in the spring of the year. 
And so we see that 457 of before the common era is actually the seventh year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. So this helps us a great deal because this is a date that's not even disputed by secular astronomers or chronologists because of the movement of the heavenly bodies, everything is detailed. We know exactly when this took place. But the fascinating thing is, is that the book of Ezra tells us about this year. In Ezra chapter seven, verses one through 28, we're going to take a section of this and read this. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, this is the year 457 before the common era. The king granted Ezra all his requests concerning the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem and the holy temple. And upon the first day of the first month began Ezra to go up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. What is the date, ladies and gentlemen? Aviv 1, 457 before the common era, exactly 483 years to the very day before Yeshua walked over the Jordan River, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, exactly 483 years or 69 sevens of years to the very moment Ezra began to leave Babylon to go up to Jerusalem. And the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, the singers, the porters, the Nethanims arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. It took us four months of traveling to get to Jerusalem across Iraq, what is now Jordan, and then to Jerusalem. Now, Ezra 7 continues, this is a portion of the letter that the king Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest the scribe of the commandments of the Lord. I, Artaxerxes, make a decree that all they of the people of Israel and their priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. Therefore, listen carefully and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven sevens and 62 sevens, exactly to the very day, the first day of the first month. Ladies and gentlemen, you are only going to get one Messiah. And this is it. The ancient Jewish sages said that to find the timing of the coming of the Messiah, one needs look no further than the book of Daniel. But once he came, and he didn't play religion the way they wanted him to play, then they were the first ones that said, we don't listen to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, this nails it absolutely dead on. We have proven when Yeshua comes. We have proven when his baptism was, when he came out of the wilderness, when he went up to Jerusalem. All these details are there. Now we see that he literally is fulfilling what the prophet Daniel was given by the angel Gabriel, and this is how it goes down. From Aviv 1, that's when the acceptable year of the Lord begins. And then it says, unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven sevens. From the going forth of the command to restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven sevens. And it says, the wall will be built again in the street, literally the plaza, that's the platform upon which the temple is going to be rebuilt. Solomon's temple will then be rebuilt and replaced by Zerubbabel's temple. And it says the wall will be built again in the, the plaza even in troublous times. And that we see that when we went up and we began to restore and build Jerusalem, that that is when Sanballat and the people who are in the nation, the Samaritans, came against us and tried to thwart us in everything that we were doing. It records that time as specifying that we had a trowel in one hand, a sword in the other. 
indicating that half of the people were on guard duty, the other half of the people were building. And it was a troublesome time in which we actually rebuilt the city and the wall, and it took seven sevens, or 49 years to do it. Seven Sabbath years is what it would take, seven sevens. And then it says, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be not only seven sevens, but also 62 sevens. So from that time the seven sevens ended, you add another 62 sevens, and we come to Aviv 1, 27 of the Common Era. And then there's another phrase here, after 62 sevens shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So again, after the 62 sevens, which ends up in the year 27 of the Common Era, beginning the acceptability of the year of the Lord, then one year later in 28 of the Common Era, that is when the Messiah is cut off, but not for himself. Now, this chart shows you every year from 14 of the Common Era all the way to the year 40 of the Common Era. And we see that in this chart, this is detailing the sighting of the new moon, which is calculatable down to one ten thousandth of a percent of illumination. And in that, we see that in all these years, the first time that we have a Wednesday at sundown in which the new moon appears is going to be in the year 17 of the Common Era. 17 of the Common Era doesn't even get as close to when Yeshua's ministry began, right? It was 10 years before. Yeshua is not yet 20 years of age at this particular point in time. So can that be the year of the crucifixion? No. In fact, for Yeshua to have a 70-week ministry, 490 days, to be a fulfillment of the second level of Daniel's prophecy, there must be an Adar bet. And so what we're going to look at, we're going to go on down the line, and we are going to see that in the years which we have an Adar bet, we go all the way down to 28 of the Common Era, and there we have an Adar bet, a 13th month, and there we have the first sliver of the new moon appearing after sunset on a Wednesday, the month of the Aviv barley in the year 28 of the Common Era. When is the next available time? We go all the way to the year 34 of the Common Era, and that is the next moment in time in which we have the first sliver of the new moon appearing Wednesday at sundown so that we will have a Wednesday sacrifice of the Passover lambs. Ladies and gentlemen, these are your only choices. You get two. 34 of the common era in which Yeshua is now 37 years old. He's dying of old age instead of on the cross. In which literally Yeshua would have to have about a seven year ministry. And I've heard people say this, he had about a seven year ministry. Why do they say that? Not because it's found any place in the Bible, because they have a favorite eschatology, a favorite chronology that they're trying to work out that has nothing to do with reality. Ladies and gentlemen, you have one choice, and here it is, 28 of the Common Era. You can go to any accomplished astronomer in the world, and this is exactly what you are going to find. This is the creator's original time clock, and this nails down exactly the year in which it took place. Now, as it says in Daniel 9, 27, it says that he shall confirm the covenant with many, 417. The word he here, Hal Lindsey translated into the Antichrist in his book, Late Great Planet Earth. This is, concept is not found any place in the pages of scripture, nowhere in the book of Daniel, but it was fabricated in the imagination of Hal Lindsey. Now, even though he has edited his book many times, he has never changed this. He has never bothered to check the Hebrew and to see that he who confirms the covenant is the same one who made the covenant in his blood, who made reconciliation for iniquity, who made atonement for sin, and who anointed the most holy. 
It's the Messiah who is cut off, but not for himself. He is the one who will confirm the covenant that's been made in his blood. The blindness in part that has happened to Israel will be removed at the time of the end of the time of the Gentiles, when he opens the eyes of Israel, when he confirms the covenant that was made in his blood then, that is when it begins the last Shavuah, the last seven. Remember, we have 69 sevens from the going forth of the commandment until the Messiah comes, and that is the acceptable year of the Lord. He is cut off in the next year after the 62 sevens. But yet there's one seven left remaining, is there not? That's right. And here it is. It is called the confirmation of the covenant. And when the covenant is confirmed, that begins the last seven. Now, some would say, well, what precedent do you have separating the 69 sevens from the one seven? Well, it's called the fulfillment of the spring feast, the Messiah coming as a suffering servant, and the fulfillment of the fall feast, this Messiah coming back to reign as a conquering king. That is the context of the entire Torah. But if we don't understand the feast of the Lord, then we want to put them all together, scrunch them all together, make Yeshua's ministry half of the seven, and then the book of Acts to thou sort of Cornelius, the other half of the seven, and then we can have the Pope reign from his throne in Rome as the Christ on earth, almighty God upon the earth, as he calls himself. We, the Pope, are almighty God upon the earth. I'm quoting the Pope. See, that's why I'm running for Pope. <laughs> Things have got to be corrected. It's not because I think I'm almighty God. No, I know I'm not. Things have got to be corrected. So please, again, do your best. Put the pressure on the College of Cardinals. Get me elected as Pope. The confirmation of the covenant is what starts the last seven. Has this happened yet? No. Until this goes down, Yeshua's return is not even seven years away at this point. The covenant has not been confirmed. The fall feast, their enemy fulfillment, the latter day outpouring of the Holy Spirit has not taken place. The 144,000 of all of the tribes of Israel, not of Judah, of Israel, have not been sent forth to the nations. The gospel of the kingdom has not been preached in all the world. There's a lot of things that haven't happened yet, ladies and gentlemen. Now, and in the midst of the seven, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even under the consummation. And here it is, in the midst of the seven, this is the abomination of desolation. Now, shortly after Daniel's life, it was in the year 265, before the common era, that's when Antiochus Epiphanes went into Jerusalem, took over the Temple Mount, put a statue of Jupiter on the Temple Mount, declaring Jupiter to be God on Jupiter's birthday, December 25th, which is also Kislev 25 that year. And then he roasted a pig on the altar, defiling the altar, and starting a tradition which is still carried out in the southern states, doing a pig roast as a Sunday school picnic. Uh, I'll never forget the, uh, the words of Smith Wigglesworth. He was at a, a, uh, a, a, at a church picnic in which they uh, had roasted a pig. And he was asked if he would pray before the meal. And uh, I don't know if it was reluctantly, but he said, Almighty God, if you can bless what you've already cursed, then bless this pig. Amen. In the time of Antiochus, roasting that pig on the altar was the abomination that made the altar desolate. 
That was the abomination of desolation back then. That is not the abomination of desolation that Daniel was speaking of for the end times, nor the abomination of desolation that Yeshua was speaking of in which was recorded in Matthew 24 when Yeshua said, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. If you're in Jerusalem, get out of there immediately. If you're on top of the house, do not drop down to get a jacket. Or if you're out in the field, do not come back and get a sleeping bag. You better take off out of Jerusalem and hope that it's not on the Sabbath. Because if you've got to get a million people out of Jerusalem with no buses and no taxi cabs running, it is going to be extremely difficult. You better hope you don't have any little children that you're pregnant or nursing, because then is going to come great tribulation, such as has never been from the beginning of time, nor nor ever shall be, and except those days that be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. Mankind is going to bring himself to the brink of destruction, and it's all going to start. The talos is going to begin when you see the abomination of desolation, and that is when it takes place in the midst of that last seven. The last seven has not started yet. So what we see in the first layer is 70 sevens, and these are sevens of years. Seven sevens, 62 sevens, after 62 sevens, one seven, and in the midst of the seven. That is exactly how it breaks down in Daniel's prophecy. So these are Shavuaim. So we see that it operates on one level, they are sevens of years that are fulfilled in every one of these layers on the first layer. Now we are going to see them fulfilled in Yeshua's ministry in literal weeks, 70 weeks. This means seven day periods. 70 weeks are determined. And these 70 weeks are determined from when Yeshua is baptized in water until the day that he baptizes with the Holy Spirit. It is exactly 70 weeks, 490 days to the day, and most of the time we know where he is on a daily basis and a lot of the times just on a weekly basis, but we can track him and see his ministry as he fulfills the second layer of Daniel's prophecy. Now, I did not set out to correct the calendar to understand the future. I went back to correct the ancient biblical calendar because in order to detail the Messiah's ministry and understand the chronology of the Gospels, the ancient calendar must be understood. There is no way that the Gospels can be understood, the chronology can be put together unless we understand the ancient calendar and the Feast of the Lord and when they are being fulfilled. You can never count to three, you can never find the year that it happened. None of these things have ever been detailed in American Christianity before this very day. And so what you are learning right now are things that the sages have desired to look into. I have desired to see them my whole life and had no understanding why I woke up one day and I was absolutely compelled and driven to restore the ancient biblical calendar. Why? Because I needed to understand the ministry of Yeshua. The Gospels were the things that drove me that I had to understand these things. And as I've been teaching now for over 10 years, you can't understand the Gospels until you understand the Torah and the prophets. So after I introduced this whole concept seven and a half years ago, and it was recorded out here on the West Coast, and that, those tapes went out, and many scholars through these years have said it's the finest work I've ever done because it's the first time the Gospels have ever made sense, and this is a report I'm getting from PhDs and doctors of divinity and PhDs that finally it's all fitting but seven and a half years ago, after I introduced it in six hours, I stopped. And since then, I have been teaching the Torah and the prophets all these years so that the foundation is laid so that we can finally understand the Gospels. 
So after all this time of saying that we have to understand the Torah and the prophets in order to understand the gospels, and I've been teaching the Torah and the prophets all these years, now I'm saying it's time for believers to understand the gospels, but you have to start by stripping away all the Babylonian sun god worship that you inherited, or you will never understand a single word that Yeshua is teaching. You'll never find the gate that leads to life because we've been so immersed in a false religious system that we can't count to three we can't get one single sign right. The only sign that we were ever given, the only sign that we were ever promised, and we can't get it, and who cares? Well, I care. You care. I want to follow the true Messiah. I'm tired of another Jesus dressed up like a Babylonian sun god. Seventy weeks to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal the vision and prophecy, anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks, seven weeks, 62 weeks, after 62 weeks, one week, in the midst of the week, we are going to see this same pattern now in Yeshua's ministry, watch it as it comes down. After 62 weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Take a look at the calendar. Right here is week number 62 of Yeshua's ministry. I didn't make this up. These dates, the sighting of the new moon, accurate down to one ten thousandth of a percent of illumination. We are just watching Yeshua's ministry unfold through the year, and we find out at the end of week number 62, when the Passover lamb is selected, Yeshua makes his triumphal entry. And now, after 62 weeks, it begins the 63rd week right here. One week, here it is. The one week happens after 62 weeks. In the midst of the week, right here in the midst of the week, that is when Yeshua is cut off, but not for himself. The mathematical probabilities of this happening are a bazillion to one. You can quote me on that. One bazillion to one. And now we're going to take a look at this chart as we bring it up and see again that the anointing at Lazarus' house happens on the last day of the 62nd week. And the 63rd week begins, and this is where it begins, and this is where it ends. One week, Yeshua is cut off in the midst of the week. Now it says seven weeks. Where are the seven weeks in this pattern? Remember, after three days and three nights in the grave, then the first fruit offering is done on the morning of the first day of the week after the weekly Sabbath during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. At that moment, we begin counting seven sevens. Seven Sabbaths. And the day following seven Sabbaths is Shavuot. The seventh Sabbath is day 49 of the counting of the Omer. It is also day 490 of Yeshua's ministry. In order for that to be correct, that means there cannot be one month that is 29 days that was 30, or one day that was actually 30 that is counted as 29. It, every one of them has to be right. So that the 490th day of the Yeshua's ministry is the 49th day of the counting of the Omer. The seven sevens are right here. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one seven. We're going to go back to Daniel's original reckoning. One seven, one seven period of year. Right here, the confirmation of the covenant. Remember, this is when the last seven begins. But you notice there are no dates there. What I'm going to present to you tonight is that with the third layer of Daniel's prophecy, we can put a date in there. Isaiah prophesied several things. One of them is that 
In the last days, Israel's leaders would do wickedly against God's covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Abraham that all the land from the Euphrates all the way to the great river in Egypt belongs to Israel. Isaiah prophesied that in the last days, Israel's leaders would do wickedly against that covenant and that they would make an, a, a covenant with death, an agreement with hell, in which they would give over part of that land for the exchange of a promise of peace. This covenant with death was typified by Isaiah as a bed too short to stretch out on and as covers that are not long enough to cover. And that this covenant with death would be annulled by violence. Now going by that precise detail and realizing that Israel entered into such a covenant on September 13, 1993, which is known as the Oslo Peace Accord, which Oslo in modern Hebrew means toilet seat, by the way. <laughs> so don't tell me the Almighty does not have a sense of humor. The toilet seat accord of 1993 <laughs> was confirmed on Tishri 1 of that year. <laughs> That covenant from September 13th, those who made that covenant said it was a seven-year agreement, a seven-year covenant, in which at the end of the seven years, part of Jerusalem would be turned over to the Palestinians, the Temple Mount was up for grabs by the Pope, and there was going to be quite an exchange that goes on. Now, if this is the covenant with death, and I believe that it was, I said that the Almighty will annul that covenant with death and that we would see violence erupt in Jerusalem before sundown, September 28th of 2000. Because at sundown, that would have been the full seven years according to the Creator's calendar. And it had to be annulled before sundown. The morning of September 28th, 2000, Ere Shron went up on the Temple Mount, opened the Bible, read the prophecy of Ezekiel, the violence erupted, the bloodshed began, the second intifada ensued, the covenant with death was annulled by violence on that very day. Now, that is why I said, this proves the Almighty runs the universe according to his calendar and to his time clock. Now, honestly, I expected that war to ramp up much more furiously than it did. I expected that thing to go full-blown at that time, and it didn't. Well, I'm very thankful that, uh, that my expectation was not fulfilled. You know, frankly, I don't know about you, but, you know, I do believe the Scriptures say that those who desire to see the day of the Lord lack understanding. You know, you know I, I'm not stupid, but I want to be aware of the times and seasons which we live and not pretend that everything is going to go on the way it always has, that we're going to live happily ever after. We need to face reality. The book of Revelation was written to the servants of the Messiah who need to know some of the tough things that we're going to have to face. And so when that happened, that proved to me the creator runs the universe on his calendar and his time clock. Anyone that wants to argue about wanting to keep the rabbinic calendar or this calendar or that calendar, I don't care what calendar you want to keep. You can keep the Zulu pygmy calendar for all I care. I'm just not going anyplace with you, okay? And I'm not saying you have to go anyplace with me either. Isaiah also prophesied an incredible event. Who hath heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Isaiah 
prophesied about the rebirth of the nation of Israel. A hundred years ago, most of the Christian world said Israel will never become a nation again. All the promises that God made to Abraham and Israel, he has now transferred over to the Gentile Christians. All of his covenants he made with Abraham are null and void. And yet there were other believers who said, not a chance. If the Almighty can break his covenant with Abraham and Israel, then there is nobody safe. And they said, Israel will become a nation in one day. And in 1948, May 15th, 1800 hours, Washington, D.C. time, that is when the United Nations then determined that Israel would become a nation in one day. Now, 1800 hours Washington, D.C. time that year happened to be midnight Jerusalem time, May 15th, 1948. Now, if you check all of the records, of course, the, the Jewish calendar date was a Yar 6. It was midnight in Jerusalem on a Yar 6. And when you look at a Yar 6, then you look at the the feast calendar, and you realize it's the 21st day of the counting of the Omer. It's basically a nowhere date. It doesn't mean anything. And many people looking at this through the last generation said that if the Creator runs the universe according to his calendar, why was not Isaiah's prophecy concerning the rebirth of Judah as a nation, of Israel as a nation, why did that not happen on a significant date? Because I was teaching through these, this last 10 years that the Creator fulfills his, his feast and his covenants according to his calendar. And yet, we can see that this is a nowhere date. So some people suggested that this really isn't the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. This is maybe when the United Nations determined Israel would become a nation, but this isn't God's method. This isn't his timing. And as I looked at this, it had bothered me for a long time. And uh, back in Israel this year, when I finished up my work in America, we did our tour in America. I went to then uh, Costa Rica and toured and spoke in Costa Rica, then spent two weeks in Nigeria. And when we returned from Nigeria and teaching uh, pastors in Nigeria, I went home to Israel, I spent a week with my wife, and then I got the mattress from our guest bedroom, and I told my wife that I was going down to the office, and I would be back every Sabbath day. And I said, do not call me unless the house has already burned down and the fire is out. If it's that kind of emergency, call me after the fire is out and let me know. But don't interrupt me. Other than that, I will be home every Sabbath. And so my first stint, I went down and I spent over 200 hours just reading the Gospels over and over and over, day and night, just to get my random access memory loaded up with the material so I could begin processing chronology. Because when I work chronology, I have to spend hundreds of hours in seclusion to get all of the material loaded up in my brain so that I can process these things and then I can work them. And so I had been working on that for a good 200 hours and then my next 100 hours, I was work working with ancient calendar calculations. And as I was sitting at my desk at the office, I looked at this date and it was just bothering me so much and I thought, well, Israel was determined to become a nation earlier than that. It was November 29th of 1947 that the United Nations decided that they were going to make Israel a nation someday. And so I went back and looked at that on the calendar and I saw, well, that's a nowhere date as well. And as I sat there looking at this, I was just grieved by it. I knew there was something more to it, but there was just nothing there. And then all of a sudden, I looked at that date, a yar six, and I said, what if the mathematical logarithms that were put in place in 359 of the Common Era by Hillel II that were borrowed from Arab astronomers in Babylon, 
when they changed the calendar, what if the logarithms they set up at that time, they added an Adar bet to this year, and an Adar bet was not necessary? And so I backed off the calculations, re-ran them according to the parameters of what we have learned of when the barley is aviv in the land of Israel. And then I saw what is before you on this chart. From 1944 all the way to 1962. And there it was. May 15th, 1948, 1800 hours, Washington, D.C. time, with Savan 6. Midnight in Jerusalem, the 49th day of the counting of the Omer, the following day is Shavuot. This is a thing that we had missed our entire life, that for years, for centuries, we were told to count the Omer every single year in the spring. When we present the bickering, the first fruits of the barley harvest, we count our seven Sabbaths. And the counting of the seventh Sabbath, the 49th day of the county of the Omer, Israel became a nation in one day at that moment, and the following day was Shavuot. Now watch how the details play out. Daniel was given a cryptic 70 Shavuot in response to his request to understand the 70 years prophecy of Jeremiah. 70 years is the third prophetic layer of Daniel's prophetic code. 70 years, seven years, 62 years, after 62 years, one year and in the midst of the year, now watch as it lays out. 70 years are determined. And where do we begin counting the 70 years? The 49th day of the county of the Omer, the following day, bam, that is the first countdown. That is the first feast of Shavuot. That is where we begin our counting, and we count 70 years, which brings us to the year 2017. It is the 70th year from when Israel becomes a nation in one day, fulfilling the last day prophecy of Isaiah. Now, if that's all it is, that's not much. Watch how every single layer that was fulfilled in the first two are now laid out in the third layer. 62 years. From year one, 1948, we come 62 years, and then watch what happens, because 62 years is the very year before the last week, the last seven, begins. After 62 years brings us to year 63. One year, this one year, and in the midst of the year, this is what happens. Layer one of the 70 Shavuot commences when the Messiah confirms the covenant 417. And here it is on this chart. This is the 63rd year. In this year, in the midst of the year, that is when we begin, year, uh, we, we begin Tishri 1 of 6010, and that also begins when the covenant is confirmed and begins the last seven, the last seven, the last Shavua in which in the midst of the year, we are going to see the uh, midst of the seven is the abomination of desolation. In the midst of the seven, the oblation and sacrifice cease, the abomination which makes desolate shall stand in the holy place. So here is the last seven of Daniel's first layer. And right here is in the midst of the seven. When does it start? In the midst of the 63rd year. And it ends in the midst of the 70th year. Now, watch this, the countdown to the final midst of the year. When does the countdown, okay, when does the countdown to the final jubilee year begin? Now, we've got a couple of, of layers to lay in here, so let's take it slow for a minute here. Because I will show you how every one of the layers of Daniel's prophecy that are fulfilled on the first two levels are then fulfilled on the last level. But there was always something bothering me in this because I knew that there were seven sevens 
of years that had to be found in this last period. There has to be the seven sevens of years that brings us up to the final jubilee. But the question is, how are the jubilees determined? The same way as the Feast of Shavuot is determined. In other words, every year, when the first sliver of the new moon appears and the barley is a bee, those qualifying things will then let us know when Passover is and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Once we know when that week is, we can find the weekly Sabbath, and then we can find out at that moment when we are going to have the bickering first fruit harvest, and then we can begin counting our seven Sabbaths from then. But until certain things take place, we can't even begin counting. That's why the scripture says that day and hour knows no man. The creator's reckoning of time does not allow us to calculate things far into the future. We have to wait until certain things take place, and once they take place, then we can begin counting. And until they happen, we don't know what to count from. Every year it's like that. It would be nice to say that 120 jubilees from creation would be the year 6001, and everything would come down exactly on the year 6001. But there's no, nothing in the scripture that tells us to start counting jubilees from creation. When we start counting the seven Sabbaths, it's from when we enter the land. So we've been thrown out of the land several times. Israel became a nation in one day, but yet did we fulfill anything at that point that would allow us to begin counting the seven Sabbaths to the Jubilee at that time? Obviously not, because we came to Israel's Jubilee from when they became a nation, and about the biggest thing that happened that year is Breitling uh, made a new watch for Israel's 50th Jubilee. I mean, no, nothing prophetically happened. I mean, concerning the Creator's time, nothing happened at that time. Nothing took place that year. But what took place the 20th year of when Israel became a nation? The 20th year of a male child, of a man child, is when they go to war. Israel's 20th year was 1967. Eight Arab nations attacked Israel the world military strategist said Israel would be history in just a couple months. There is no way that Israel will survive. Israel fought for six days, and the seventh day, Israel rested. The seventh day, all of Israel's enemies surrendered. What did they surrender to? You can hear the story of how the Syrian tank division was rolling across the Golan Heights and they stopped and turned around and went right back to Syria and surrendered. Why? They saw the divisions of Israeli tanks firing away and coming at them, and they knew that they would not survive the attack. They turned around and went back and surrendered. What was actually up on the Golan Heights? An Israeli tank with the track blown off it, firing one 105 howitzer. That's all that was up there. The miracles that happened to get Israel's enemies to surrender after six days of fighting could only be orchestrated by heaven. It was not because of Israel's superior military might. It's because the Almighty fought for them. That is the time that Israel took Jerusalem for the first time in nearly 2,000 years. We took Jerusalem, we took the Temple Mount, and that began the counting of the seven sevens. Watch where it lands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the Jubilee year is the 70th year from when Israel became a nation. Right down to the year. 
But we could never find it because we had all forsaken the Creator's reckoning of time. And we wanted to keep our little groups together, and we wanted to go by our little particular calendars, and we wanted to fight and gnaw and claw at each other instead of discover what the Almighty had hidden for us if we would open his, our eyes to His times and His seasons. So, now, the confirmation of the covenant these calculations are correct, and ladies and gentlemen, every layer appears now in this last 70 years, 2010 of the Common Era. Many of you will recognize this chart from the back of your calendars that I've published for many years. Every year in the back of the calendar, I put right at the top of this chart, if this is the year that the covenant is confirmed, this is how the events will play out over the next seven years. Now, every year when I publish this, I did not expect that this was going to be the year that the covenant would be confirmed. I put that on there if this is the year because this is the pattern. And every single year, Thousands and thousands of people were getting the feast of the Lord either through television or because the video's getting out to them. And so they needed to see the most current chart if the covenant is confirmed this year. Now, there were years I knew there's no way it can happen this year. But yet, the point is the pattern is important. And so, on the back of the calendar this year, you will notice that there is not one of these charts. In my opening comments in the calendar, I said that I am going to deliver the charts to you in person, and that was my desire. At the end of this evening, I wanted to be able to put these charts in your hands. Unfortunately, with the bombing going on, I had to leave Israel a little bit earlier than I expected, about a month earlier, just because we didn't want to get caught in country if the airlines started to shut down and I couldn't get back to America for this tour. And so I was not able to finish them up. But now, the charts no longer say if this is the year, because the charts say 6010, 2010 of the common era, this is when the 63rd year begins, and in the midst of that year, this is when we will see the overflowing scourge, the 10 days of awe, Zechariah's thermonuclear war. This is when Damascus will become a ruinous heap. See, when this thing was going on this summer, other than, you know, taking an occasional dive into the bomb room when the air raid sirens went off, you know, we were not concerned that this thing was going to ramp up. Many people thought, well, this is the end. It's all going to go up uh, uh, sky high from here. You know what? At this point, we knew this thing is going gonna, gonna to ramp up a little bit, and it's going to go back down again. There are things that are going to be happening in the next few years to where you are going to know if this is coming down. This is not going to sneak up on anyone. But I will say that if this is not the pattern, if this is not the third layer of the fulfillment of the 70 Shavuot prophecy of Daniel that we are in right now, then you can just all relax because this pattern cannot repeat for generations. So the detail of what transpires fulfilling the feast of the Lord is yet a few years away. That means we have about four years before, not the end, we've got about four years before the hammer drops and life on earth will never be the same again. What does that mean? That means that we've got time to make a difference now. That means it's not time to wrap up in a bed sheet, go stand out on a hill and wait for the Messiah to return. He has given us a job to do and he has not called us off from the job to go into the whole world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. That job is not fulfilled. Now, I get a lot of criticism because I'm not telling everyone to pack up and move to Israel right now. Now, of course, the criticism comes from people who live in America that don't live in Israel. 
I live in Israel, and I've got a reason for saying, you know, it's not time for everyone to pack up and move to Israel. We got scattered all over the world for a reason. And it wasn't so that we could all go down to Belize and live in a tropical paradise with a generator and, and hordes of Oprah reruns to keep us happy during the tribulation. <laughs> We've been sent into the whole world to preach the good news of the gospel of the kingdom and wake people up and let them know that Yeshua is the prophet that we must obey. That he has shown us the way into the kingdom. And it's a whole lot different than the way that he has been represented by the rest of the world. Now, this is the lunar chart from the year 1994 all the way to the year 2018. Would you like to see what happens in the year 2017? No, I'm not going to show you. Because... There are some things that you just can't tell in advance. The Almighty runs the universe according to his calendar and his time clock, and he has constructed it in such a way that we must trust him. We can't plan it all out in the future and think it's going to go our way. Even the details of what I lay out, I'm under no delusion that things are going to go exactly the way I think they're going to go. They are going to go exactly the way the Almighty has planned them, and he is the one who lets us in on a little bit of the picture once in a while. And so Daniel's prophecy that he was given, this cryptic 70 Shabuim, is fulfilled in weeks of years. This brings us to the coming of the Messiah, and when the Messiah is cut off. And it also promises in the future that there will be a time that he, the Messiah, confirms the covenant with his people, and it starts the last seven. We are shown that the second layer shows us when Yeshua is baptized in water, and it is literally 70 weeks or 490 days until he baptizes with the Holy Spirit in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the early rain. We are also shown on the third level that Daniel's 70 Shavuahim, which was given to him in response to the question of the 70 years, that it brings us to the last 70 years leading up to the Messiah's return. And the Messiah's return is the seventh year of the last Shavuah. And where it all begins is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, Israel will become a nation again in one day, and Israel became a nation on the 49th day of the county of Omer. Now we finally understand why every single year, as we have been counting the Omer, and we have looked at each other and said, why are we counting the Omer? We know that we were told to do this forever, we know that we're doing it every year. We know that Yeshua, when he ascended on the 40th day of the county of the Omer, you know, he ascended to let us know that, you know, it's not fulfilled yet. He left right in the middle of this whole thing, and yet there's something that we're supposed to do, and we are to count the Omer forever. Because in the last days, the Almighty would let his people know that his calendar and his time clock is still the way he rules the universe. And when Israel became a nation in one day, that started the last generation. The next day we began counting, and we count 70 years to bring us into the fulfillment of the first layer of Daniel's prophecy and the third layer of Daniel's prophecy. But until we understood the second layer of Daniel's prophecy and understood that the gospel show us the Messiah as he fulfills the feast of the Lord in the acceptable year of the Lord in 70 weeks, until we saw that, we could never calculate accurately either the first or the last fulfillment. And now you have all three in your hands at this point in time. For months... 
I would get chills thinking about this. When I saw this, that Israel became a nation one day on the 49th day of the count of the Omer, I started to feverishly put these charts together and then I called my wife in the middle of the week and I said, I'm coming home, I have something to show you. Now, my wife, uh, in her office, on her desk, she keeps uh, uh, calculus and trigonometry books. She does calculus and trig problems for fun. <laughs> She's a little strange. <laughs> and when I laid this down in front of her and laid out the patterns and showed it to her, and she saw the patterns on this, she said, you have got to pray for an angel from heaven to confirm this. This is incredible. And so I prayed. We prayed together. And over the next several weeks, I had two people come to my house out of the blue that they were compelled to show me their chronology that they'd been working on. Now, one of these people I knew before, so I knew that this person wasn't an angel. But another person just showed up at my house on the Sabbath, and I'm thinking, you know, I don't know. This could be. You can't, you can't determine it. And so with both of these people, I sat down and I listened to the details, and then I pointed out where there were fatal errors in their reckoning. And both of them were willing to live with their fatal errors because their system was so important and they spent so much time on their system that the fatal errors were inconsequential. And I said, no, if the math doesn't work in one area, you have to hold, throw the whole thing out because the math doesn't work. And so, where was the confirmation? The confirmation is all I saw were fatal errors. And then one morning, four o'clock in the morning, I was awakened. I heard a voice that shouted at me, you have a fatal error. <laughs> well, I sat up in bed. I mean, the chills ran through me. They still run through me right now, thinking of that moment. Because I got up out of bed and I went upstairs and I first started looking at things that I had worked on 20 years ago, thought were correct, but had not rechecked them. And so I went back and rechecked them and I found my error within about an hour and it took me 36 straight hours to find the answer. But when I heard that, I realized that my entire system could be completely destroyed just like that and I could be left with nothing after all these years. I found the error. 36 hours when I found the answer, I realized the answer is so much greater than the error, the assumption that I'd lived with most of my life. And yet, there was one piece left of the puzzle, and that was the seven sevens in the final jubilee. I knew it had to be there. And I left Israel knowing it had to be there, but it's not there. I searched for it for months, and it was not there. I knew it had to be there, but without it, I knew this was incomplete. I, could, I can't say, I would love to say, thus saith the Lord, this is it, but I can't say it. I am showing you the patterns. I'm saying these patterns are dead on accurate, and they are not repeatable in any soon generation. But yet I knew the seven sevens leading up to the final jubilee, I couldn't find it. And while I was on this tour, I took my afternoon nap. I woke up, and as soon as I woke up, I knew the answer. I hadn't thought of it in weeks, maybe a month. And the answer was right there. I got up, I charted it out, and I looked at it, and I said, how stupid could I be? It's right there. It's so obvious anyone could figure this out. And then I realized, no, it's not because I'm stupid. That's beside the point. <laughs> it's because we are blind until the Almighty opens our eyes, and there's nothing we can do about it. He is the one that decides to open our eyes when he opens our eyes, and when our eyes are open and we see, it's so obvious. But until that day, it's not obvious. So I ask you last night to pray, and I'm going to ask you to continue praying because the Holy Spirit has got to confirm this to you. I can't do it. I have laid down the evidence before you and before all those that are watching, and the Holy Spirit has got to confirm this and let you know what you are supposed to do in this life. 
If we've got a few years to get some work done, that means these are going to be very important years because what we are rewarded for for eternity is dependent upon what we do in this life. Salvation is of grace. Reward is of merit. And I don't want to get up off of my knees and off my face, off the sea of fire and glass, and realize that all the wood hand stubble has been burned up and I have nothing to present to the king. I don't want that. So we have an opportunity in our life, and that is to live for him and to live with the intensity that is due the time and moment. Daniel was praying about the fulfillment of prophecy because he knew he had a responsibility in this life. And concerning the last things, then the angel Gabriel was sent down to tell him, no, Daniel, don't worry about it. You will have finished your course. You'll be in the grave before any of these things come to pass. But not so with those of you in this room. The things that Daniel desired to look into, the things that Sir Isaac Newton spent the remaining years of his life pouring over the scriptures and the prophecies of Daniel, the greatest mathematical and scientific mind of his generation went to his grave haunted with this, knowing that he did not have the answer. It's not because Sir Isaac Newton was stupid. It's because the time had not come yet. But Isaac Newton asked the questions that NASA answered that finally knowledge increased to the point where we could have in our hands the answers to which the sages have searched for generations. And if this is what we've been entrusted with, then we dare not treat it lightly. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time that we have had together. And I ask that anything that is not of you be erased from everyone's memory, let it be forgotten, expunged, completely eradicated. But everything that is of your Holy Spirit, if you have indeed given us that sweet taste of eternity, and to know that the return of our Lord is nigh at hand. And that you've called us to reach out to the nations of the world and to make your truth known. I ask that you will bury that truth deep within the heart of every soul. And now, as everyone gives, let it be an offering to you. Let it be an offering that is in accordance with the blessing that you have given. And may you multiply back to those who sow seed into your kingdom now and in the time of trouble ahead that you will be their sufficiency in every single area of their life. That they will want for nothing, but they will be able to walk the path that you set before them and press on into your kingdom, taking many with them. Those that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and those that lead many to righteousness will shine as the stars forever and ever and ever. Our offering we give to you, our heart is yours. Lead us in the path that you would have us go. In the name of Yeshua, our Savior, our King, our Messiah. Amen. I would be remiss to let you go without the one thing that the priests of Israel were commanded to do. And that is they were commanded to put the name of Yahweh upon the people by speaking a particular blessing over the people. And when that blessing is spoken, the Almighty says he hears from heaven and he will bless his people. It's not up to me to bless you, he will bless you. 
and we have seen people that have been completely crippled immediately healed, people that have had diseases immediately delivered. We've seen so many things happen, and it's up to him. It's not up to me, because he's the one that wants to bless you. And so I am going to speak that blessing over you, and I'm going to do it not under the authority of the Levitical priesthood, I'm going to do it under the authority of the Kohen Gadol forever, Yeshua, the high priest, and he is the one who has made us priests and kings. So everyone who would like to receive that blessing, just stand up right where you are. You don't have to come forward, just stand up where you are. If you don't want to receive the blessing, just stay seated. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahweh, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Holy Yahweh, we stand under the shadow of your wings. And before you, we present our heart all that we have, all that we are, and all that we ever hope to attain in this life. We lay down at your feet, and we say that it is all yours. Take us as we are. Grind us and mold us and shape us into vessels which are fit for your use. Put a coal of fire upon our tongues and purge us from any iniquity in our life. Anything that is not right before you, we ask you to burn away. Any shoots that have grown up in our lives, though full of leaves they may be, if they will never bring forth fruit, we ask you to cut them off and prune us so that we bring forth fruit for your kingdom. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice upon the altar, and we say, take us and use us. Strengthen us to grow up into the fullness and stature of Messiah. And the one thing that we do ask is that the end of the journey on the sea of fire and glass, that we hear from you the words, well done, good job, faithful servant. If we lose everything in this life, including our lives, to hear those words from you, that is all that we ask out of this life. So take us and direct our hearts, show us the way that we should go, and cause us to be strong and to walk in it. So that you are glorified and that you are honored in all that we do and say and how we live. And this we say and this we pray in the name of Yeshua, our Savior and King. Amen. Shalom, Torah fans. I will see you on the sea of fire and glass when the smoke clears. Over two years now. How long?